Hey everybody, so today we have a special guest, Shaima Ali, and she is going to be talking to us about polyglot persistence. And this is pretty important when you have very complex systems, making sure that you're not trying to solve all problems with one database because even though some databases might tell you they can do that, chances are they can't. So join me and Shaima, who is a data scientist at Cisco for this very interesting topic. And with that, let's go check it out. Okay, so Shaima, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Ashley, for this introduction. Uh, yes, I'm Shaima Ali. Uh, I am actually working as um, a data scientist for now for with Cisco. Um, I've worked a lot with data, especially through my um, work in uh, my PhD, my graduate school. Uh, my work was all about knowledge graphs and ontologies. Yeah, all decent size enterprises will have multiple applications or multiple component applications. Mm -hmm. So with each application or each use case, you need a different model to optimize processing and to optimize modeling. And sometimes you need multiple models per one application. That is I think that's an important piece too, right? I think some people, they do acknowledge that different models are needed for different use cases, but sometimes they feel that one model is going to work for one use case. And I think you're going to be talking about why that might not always be the case. Yes, usually with these kind of challenges comes data inconsistency. And if you're trying to maintain data consistency, you fall into agility and interoperability. Mm -hmm. So this kind of situation that most enterprises are in, what makes um, using knowledge graph or shifting to a new data model is really, really slow and everybody is reluctant to go through this path. Everyone's a little scared. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think both of us have been through a few of those and I think everybody probably watching has been through a few different migrations and they're tricky and they're not always popular. Any, any decent, uh, enterprise with very small applications, you have to go through millions of records. Oh, sure. So connected data versus non-connected data, modeling, and project management, waterfall versus agility. So all this comes together in, in order to put, you have to put all these puzzles together to figure out the data model, the architecture, the application. So it's not it's not that easy. <laughs> no, and, and I love that you you paint this picture as it's as a puzzle. Oftentimes when you're you're putting a puzzle together, you think a certain piece is going to fit and then you kind of figure it out and you're like, nope, that doesn't fit. Let's try something else. That's very much what you have to do. It's a trial and error process. With that comes uh, the concept poly polyglot persistence is a term that used to describe um, when storing data is best to use multiple data storage. When decent enterprise you want to have a knowledge graph for some applications and you need to know a relational database for some transactions. And this kind of situation is what a polyglot persistence talk about. One of the people who talks really, really well about this concept called uh, James Sir, so much blogs about um, Microsoft. So let's take an example of a polyglot persistence case when we have an e-commerce situation. You will have to have uh, product catalogs and shopping cart and finance and inventory that shows how many pieces and how much does it cost uh, with transactions in the same all time the puzzle pieces right yes that's the, exactly then you have uh, a recommendation engine that works on the back end that takes personal personalized info, info and similar customers and related products um, and then you have real time analytics that needs to be done on on uh, on a real time basis, and then you have session management, and you have search engines. All this is one, just one system, e-commerce. So you end up using different engines. Each back end for e each part of it is back end. So usually, for example, product catalogs are are just a lot of unstructured data with so much diverse in how they they are defined. So relational database will not work and even knowledge graph will not work. So you need something like a document database or a key value pairs mm -hmm. where you have the flexibility. In the same time, retrieval. Different jobs need different tools is, is exactly. essentially what you're saying. Exactly. And these are different teams, by the way, like 
Mm -hmm. Each part of this is a different team. Some is some data science team, others are um, maybe API development, uh, some are data engineers, so it is completely different teams. And then once you do these applications, you have to stitch them together. This is why our easy way out to stitch different applications together. We so in this example where you have data access logic, can you give an example of what that, what it, what's an example of that? Like the data access logic is basically something like the queries that you send to the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then okay. the APIs that, that reformat these queries to answer the user. But this is, this comes with a huge expense. <laughs> uh, it, it comes with a huge expense because how can you communicate these data together? Mm -hmm. How can these data stay consistent? These data, these data stores are actually, they have a lot of overlap between them. They have a yeah. lot of things that needs to be um, aligned. And there are, mm -hmm. so wh whatever application updates or changes some sort of records in a, in a, in a data store, it has to be reflected in other data stores. The tons of yep. ETL behind this work. It's, it's astronomical and I hear what you're saying. So yes, you can you can play where the data lies, but it's not as easy as that because some of that data is redundant and has to be because it has other functions, right? Yes. And the ETL on these things has to make some kind of sense of that redundancy and find different meaning. And you don't really have the same schema and the same rationale behind all of those different data sources as well. So that adds more expense to the data processing on the other side. Right. So the basic challenges are three. The complex synced ETL to avoid inconsistency, the multiple skills needed in house. This is very mm -hmm. expensive. Mm -hmm. Like um, how many skills you need to just have some sort of an e-commerce application in-house. Operational and engineering expenses to keep the system fault tolerant because, because this stitches, if it is broken somewhere, then the whole e-commerce system is not. There's so a higher data dependency too, right? I think that goes into that fault tolerance where you really are depending each of those databases are, are accurate and there's nothing wrong with those as well. Exactly. Companies now are going to, okay, let's solve this problem with some what we call a multi-model database management system. And as much as it sounds a solution where you have a database management system that offer multiple models and at the end one integrated backend, it looks very uh, like the lifesaver, uh, but <laughs> I don't know if it's, if it's actually real now. Because so it's a <laughs> unicorn, right? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It because as you see, you have to have this circle in the middle that intersects all these together, keeps all this data inconsistent, and do the caching and the, the, the data management from one back end. That's amazing. But uh, is it actually doing the job? Like is it is it actually a graph database and mm -hmm. in the same time a relational database and in the same time key value? Mm -hmm. How? I mean, we know that the, not, the technology and the, the, the math behind each one of those is completely different, and completely diverse. That, and that's a great point. So you, you mentioned the math. I mean, graph, yeah. as much as we say it's a structure, it is based off graph theory, which is mathematical in nature. Relational data weeks have math <laughs> behind them that was exactly. you know, really exactly. developed in the 70s. Exactly, and this is a relation of the algebra. Mm -hmm. Graph or graph theory. Um, maybe if you talk about um, W3C standards, the ontologies or um, descriptive logic and formal logic, mm -hmm. these are completely distant. How can you claim that you have a knowledge graph, an ontology, and in the same time a property graph in the same time? And I think what you're saying is so timely because there are more and more of the relational databases. So you have Oracle here, but I know Mongo has one. I know that there, there are quite a few other um, relational databases that are coming out and saying, oh, but now we have a graph database as well, but it's kind of like tacked on, right? It's not really integrated effectively for the reasons that you're describing here. It's because, you know, if 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 you're saying that it does everything, chances are it's like that TV commercial, right? Like t as seen on TV, it's probably not as good as it seems. Right. 
And and I mentioned here INDB and Oracle because because they explicitly mentioned that in the in the mm-hmm. in the white papers when they said that Oracle they f- tried to fit a graph they have an Oracle graph and they try to fit it in a relational database. So they have explicitly defined tables to manage relations and tables to manage properties and tables to manage the nodes and the entities. So mm-hmm. you're, it's like you're squeezing the graph in tables. And and it makes even though the processing of that data so much more complex because there are so many different joins you have to do to exactly. essentially just make a regular triple. Exactly. No, no one size <laughs> does not fit all. Like one size does not fit all. That does not exist. I think at this point, as we speak, multi-model uh, database management system are not as effective as they sound. You know, you, you're mentioning this too. Um, Neptune, which yeah. is the AWS, they do claim, now Neptune hasn't been around for very long and, and they might have what it takes to get to that promised land that you're talking about, Shaima. Yeah, I know. Um, but right now they do claim that they do relational as well as uh, more of a triple-like structure. But the thing is, if you have actually used it, you know that they are still very much segmented. They're not they're not actually doing it at the same time. Yes, but I I guess Neptune has this struggles of trying to be the one who does all. Who the does, one-stop shop. Mm-hmm. Yes, the one who, I mean, when I was looking into it and trying it, it was trying to find a common ground between, between property graphs and uh, ontologies. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and, and it seems really weird because they didn't accomplish any of both. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> yeah, so this, this graph is, uh, I like it. So where do things go in this four quadrant? So out mm-hmm. of all the models, relational is way better than key value and column and document to express connection between things. And then of course, graph is on top of all of them. Just a, just a very small example, when you have customer and order and billing and things like that, you just have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven entities. And and in some cases, this makes sense. In some cases, you need the transactions to be in a relational database. You need the orders and the payments and things. It can be in a relational database. And, but these are all the amount of joins you have to do to get what customer purchased what and what was the shipping address. And on the other side, what we call the aggregate model, which is the key value or the document models, mm-hmm. where you have to hide all the connections and the semantics between the customer and the order and the shipping yeah. and they're all one document. Just figure it out. Yeah, th- this I think is is one of the largest drawbacks is, you know, if you do have to go this route, all that that richness is is basically, um, you know, hidden. hidden. Yeah. You can't you can't you can't see more than, you know, surface value. When you um, you don't want to go, th- you have rich relations and semantics that you don't want to hide in a NoSQL database, in, in a document or a key value pair database. And in the same time, modeling it as a relational database will make it so complex. Mm-hmm. So too many joins. And I think you mentioned that in, in, in one of your videos that yeah. when do you feel that this is the time to have a knowledge graph? When you look at how many joins you're doing and you, you look at the yeah. performance of answering very basic questions. There are some templates, what we can say template systems, that mm-hmm. when you look at it, you know knowledge graph will solve the, will save the day. Yeah. Um, so some of those, like we know, um, recommendation engines, mm-hmm. uh, supply chain optimization, um, social networking, of course. I don't know okay. how would social network exist if there's no graph behind it. Um, that, yeah, it's called um, it's called MySpace. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Were you around for MySpace? That's I that's do. what social networking looks like without a graph. That is my old days. Like that's my generation. <laughs> when you really need to mine relations, when you need to visualize relations. Yeah. And of course, what what's missing in here is search engines. Mm-hmm. and semantic search engines. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you can talk about this way better than me. 
it's, <laughs> that's your day job. <laughs> that is my day job. But you know, thanks for the plug, Shaima. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know there was I think I think um, Yastic Session you seen did an excellent job to to be the the phase before Google Knowledge Graphs. Yeah, yeah, so I think so. These are the very early steps that was taken towards semantic search. The standards actually also is is a big challenge. So it is an evolving technology with so much unknowns and so much diverse standards. Yeah. So to come up with an interoperable gra graph, I don't think that does exist right now. Or yeah. something that's reusable across different um, organizations or different platforms, I don't think that exists right now. So uh, what's left at the end is when not to use a knowledge graph. When is knowledge graph bad? <laughs> <laughs> so this is when you have to update uh, all or subset of entities when you have to go through majority or like half of your or nodes to update just one property that is that is very tough that, that's very tough and very costly yeah um it is knowledge graph are not they are not easily capturing the evolving nature of data so with real-time data you cannot use knowledge graphs mm -hmm. um, these are the behind the scene wisdom but you yeah. cannot use it in a real time access if this is all what you're doing. Um, and of course, real time updates and reads will be very challenging. So there has to be some sort of a staging between yeah. between your real time application and your back end knowledge graph. It's the same theme to to the whole um, presentation that Shima has given, which is the right tool for the right job. So you have to really look at your options and make sure you're choosing wisely. All right, Shima. So if any of you are interested in talking to Shima, she is on LinkedIn. She is awesome.